Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fifth Sunday in Lent, which falls on March 21, 2021, are from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, Psalm 51, 1 through 12, Hebrews 5, 5 through 10, and John 12, 20 to 33. So John 12 has a really interesting uh, an important function in the Gospel of John. It's Jesus' last public discourse, uh, and it, it functions as kind of a, I think it's helpful uh, for the preacher to, uh, to read the whole, uh, read the chapter in this light, that it is a, uh, a looking back on Jesus' ministry uh, and, and what it has meant and but it's also uh, it's also a looking forward. It's a, it's a it's a preamble, if you will, to the farewell discourse, uh, where some of the some of the claims that Jesus makes here uh, are going to get spelled out uh, in in the words in the farewell discourse. So it 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 functions in that regard. And we said last week that it has you know this uh, this third passion prediction or this third, you know, lifting up, right, uh, of, the, of, the, of the whole world. And when I am lifted up from earth, I will draw all people uh, to myself in 1232, which has, um, I mean, it, it, it goes back to, you know, John 316, God loving the entire world uh, and the breadth and depth of that love, but it has a different kind of ring to it here in that in verse 20, now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, they came to Philip and sir, we wish to see Jesus. And the Greeks represent the entirety of the world uh, there. That's, that's part of their role <laughs> is the world coming to see Jesus. And, uh, and it's, in that moment of the of the entirety of the world, that uh, that the hour has come now, uh, the hour has come as the world is pres as present uh, uh, here in the, at this moment, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now that the whole world is here, so it has it should have a different kind of ring to it, or the way in which the the way in which the gospel is. Uh, come has come kind of full circle uh, in this in this last discourse. So, uh, one one thought, Caroline, you changed the way that I see that passage. So I don't have uh, much to add because I'm waking up to this uh, because of listening and reading you. Um, the one that I would highlight as saying the same thing is this. Then the voice came from heaven. Um, my, my way of shifting this is already happened, still happening, mm -hmm. that this is the continual, to use the word uh, from last week, the steadfastness of God's action in the world. I have glorified it and I will glorify it. God's not done with us yet. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions about this passage one more kind of exegetical Johannine theology and one more about preaching. And the questions are not just for Caroline, they are for everybody. Well, <laughs> I was gonna give them to her. <laughs> the first one is when he says uh, in verse 31, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. What's, how does, how does the cross connect to that? Or does it connect to that? Is that is there a sense of cross as victory in some way in John that we should be aware of? Or, because there's a promise here, right? That the nature of the world is changing in this moment. At least the, the one who, who held sway soon will not hold sway any longer, right? Mm -hmm. And how is the cross or cross resurrection, ascension, whatever, a, a play a part in that? I hope that's not an esoteric it, question. It, I mean, I think that it, matters for preaching on the last. Because because Caroline's going to have a great word on this. I'm going to jump in and say something short of and frivolous. But um, I think, <laughs> I, 
I'm sorry, Ralph, you're a kitty cat. It's the podcat. <laughs> it's the podcast. Yeah, they're laughing because they can see. Here he is. It's the podcat. Bandit the podcat. Bandit the podcat, the ruler of this world. Yes. <laughs> Driven out. <laughs> Driven out. Um, but um, the uh, ongoing work that we have been talking about here, um, and you even just said that as you asked it, Matt, not just the cross, but the uh, death, resurrection, ascension, and promised return, that the incarnation is also the inbreaking of God dwelling among us and also the descending of the spirit so that this is not a one-off action or a one-off moment, but uh, that active word of driven out or driving out the evil one. And so uh, this is work that God is doing among us through Christ by the Holy Spirit. So uh, that's how I would answer that. That's a great answer. But Caroline can take it even deeper. <laughs> well, I, no, I think that's great. I, the, you know, the evil one here uh, is, it, it in part is, there's a little bit of irony uh, with the language of Akbalo to be, you know, to be thrown out. Uh, in that, uh, that's indeed, you know, th that's, that's part of the sort of thematic uh, reality of this gospel of, of being in community and um, being in the, being inside and in this community and uh, a, a community that was, uh, that was thrown out, Aposuna Gogas, uh, which will be, which is mentioned in chapter 12 as well. Uh, you will be, you know, you will be thrown out of your synagogues for believing in me. And again, in chapter 16. So there's a little bit of, uh, of irony here uh, with regard to, uh, I think it's a, in part, it's an emphasis of, of the kind of community that, that Jesus is creating and that, that Jesus is holding fast to and in which we find ourselves. And it's, um, and so it's not that you, not, you are not, you are, you aren't going to be thrown out The The evil one is going to be thrown out. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's part of what's going on here. It doesn't use um, the term evil one though, does it? It's, it says the, the ruler, the mm -hmm. archon, um, which I think changes it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't even think ruler is a very good translation. Is it or for Archon? Um, I'm just trying to think about it. I mean, because I think it. <clears throat> be ruler or leader. <laughs> yeah. Leader. Yep. <clears throat> that's, yeah. I, or the first, right? Literally, is, is it the first? Archon, is there a. I can't remember. Um, I think the question Matt raises, though, is really important, which is the text last week that we had from John 3 connected also with Ephesians 2 from last week. And then this text, it does in Lent return us to uh, basic, what, what is the theological, what is our theological view of the world from which it needs to be saved, from which we need to be saved? And there's a piece of it, which is that there's something wrong with us already. We're born into a condition in which there's something wrong with me that I need saved. But there's also part of it, which is something I need to be saved from something outside of me because someone is ruling me um, so that um, the salvation both needs to be changing me, but also changing the world. Um, and um, now how you put that together with whatever atonement, uh, uh, un, you know, the, there, there's all sorts of atonement language in the New Testament, but no theory. You know, so that all the theories of atonement are working with the text to try to put it together. And at a certain point, I do, um, I do think for me, um, Christus Victor, uh, that is that there is something in Christ, death, resurrection and ascension that is about a victory over the forces that defy the will of the triune God. Well, and it's help, I think it's helpful uh, to read a little farther um, in, in interpreting that that pass that portion of the passage as well, because the lectionary stops at 33, uh, obvious for obvious reasons. Uh, he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. So you know, fifth Sunday in Lent, let's stop there. But uh, but if you keep reading, we we're, we come again to the language of the light is with you for a little longer. 
Uh, and so the, the ruler of this world is, um, the, the ruler of this world is gonna come back in chapter 13 uh, with, uh, with Judas. Um, and so, but, uh, but it's, it is, it is another, this, this moment, uh, in John is almost like another calling of the disciples, disciples moment. It is a moment, another crisis moment of the light is only here a little longer. Uh, and, uh, and how are, how are you going to respond to that? And, uh, and so, and, but, but recognizing that there is a, there is uh, this is for the sake of the world and who will rule the world. Uh, so it's, it's bigger than your individual salvation. It's bigger than your individual relationship. It's for the sake of the, who is uh, ultimately going to be the ruler of this world. So there's, there's a cosmic, we can't let go of that cosmic element that goes back to John 1.1. 1, 1. I think you answered oh, my second question. What was that? <laughs> How to preach it. I haven't asked it yet. Oh. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was what difference does it make to think of this judgment being in the past tense, the, the way John talks about, right? That this, that, and elsewhere in John, he'll say things that he's already judged, essentially. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what, that's a, to me, that's a distinctive view among the gospels. And so just what difference does that make for, for a preacher thinking about how do I empower the people of God to live or how do I help them understand who they are so that they might live accordingly uh, or worship accordingly. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the preacher's challenge, I think. Was what, what difference does this make so people don't just go home thinking, oh, now I get that John's a little bit different, but that they actually, you know, that's a, that's a kind of human response question. What does it mean to know that my judgment is already behind mm -hmm. me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or yeah, the judging of this world is already behind us or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that circles back to the, and it's an ongoing process until Christ returns. Yeah, yeah. So, so and, this, and that's why, yeah. And that's why chapter 12 is, is really that understanding it as this kind of hinge chapter uh, between the ministry of Jesus and uh, the, the last night that Jesus has with his disciples, when... Uh, when one disciple is going to leave and the other one, uh, Peter, his betrayal is going to be foretold. And so, you know, this is, uh, that's, remember there, there's chapter 12 follows immediately after the triumphal entry and replaces the temple incident mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. And so recognizing, um, recognizing this, th this narrative role of, of what's at stake between uh, the light has been here, uh, but now we've moved into the hour really does uh, return us to this place of, of what is this, how are we going to, uh, how, what are the events of the hour? How are we going to respond to those? Um, what's, what is going to be our, how is this another crisis moment um, when we move into the events of the hour? I think it's a, key thing for this chapter. All right. Thank you. So we had a lot of covenant texts earlier in Lent. We took a break last week for the covenant of the flying snakes, but this is, now we're back to covenants here with, with Jeremiah, a new one, in fact. There's nothing covenantal about that numbers text last week, was there? I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> that's, um, yeah not, flying snakes. Not, not in the same way as these others so this is a passage most people most preachers i should say are familiar with because it it does show up a lot it's the part of jeremiah people like <laughs> as opposed to most of the rest of the book yep what's what why why now why why here in the last of the fifth sunday and let well i mean it I'm not saying like, help me understand the lectionary. I'm saying, what does it mean? I thought you no. were saying, help me understand the lectionary. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, what does it mean on March 21st, 2021? 
you know, the hard thing about this text, uh, it's it's always the text for Reformation Sunday for traditions that celebrate Reformation Sunday, just like the psalm is always the psalm for Ash Wednesday. So uh, I'm getting I'm getting liturgical year whiplash uh, here, um, frankly, uh, from these two texts that I, are so identified for me liturgically with another part of the year. So and the hard thing about this text is it never happened. Do you know what I mean? What does Jeremiah mean? And, and the, the commentary struggles with that. And finally, in a way that doesn't help me, uh, no offense to um, Henry Sun, uh, because what can't, here's the thing, no longer shall they, I will write my law in their heart, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest, right? Well, okay, that's never happened uh, for any group of Christians or Jews where you don't have to teach the next generation to know the Lord. So I don't know what it means, finally. This, that, this is one of those enduringly difficult texts for me. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, I think I'm going to lean on what uh, uh, the idea of the ongoing work uh, we are, particularly our current context has taught us uh, an immediate gratification and the expectation that everything is going to happen now. And if there's anything that we should have learned in this last pandemic year is that, um, is how to wait again. And uh, so maybe in this idea, um, you're causing me to obviously to look at this different, Ralph, but maybe the idea is to help folks realize um, what, I, what I said earlier, this isn't a, a one and done thing, but this is the ongoing work uh, that the spirit is continuing to do. So we today post resurrection anticipate the day that is coming when there is no need for the teaching rather than uh, in, in the same way that the ancient Israelites expected uh, the Messiah, and recognize, knowing their story, they expected the Messiah to come, and Jesus wasn't exactly what they thought, or what they had expected, and maybe this indwelling of God's law in our heart is not what we think it is. Um, so, Ralph, you've, you've just given me a, a way to, I, I can't answer it any further, but a way to rethink um, how to preach this text so that it is not a, a past tense, but a call to say, what will that day look like when there is no longer a need for a teacher? And what do I do in my preaching and teaching so that my congregation and communities living points toward that day yet to come? That, that's really, really helpful, Joy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I think that the, you know, what, what I can do, just so I don't get all sorts of um, emails about, uh, is point out the text, the part of the text that do make sense to me. So that Jeremiah has been announcing uh, the failure of the Southern Kingdom and, the, and therefore of the covenant with David that they believe has sustained them. Um, He's, he's been announcing for years that judgment's going to happen. And so he turns around then when the city is literally surrounded by uh, and besieged by the Babylonian army. And in that context, very real. I mean, the, uh, the, these are real soldiers with real weapons and the food's running out and people are starving in the city. And then he announces God's fidelity to the people so that the promise of the new covenant is God's sustaining grace. And I will forgive their iniquity. Remember their sin no more. I will be their God. Um, they will be my people. I mean, so that, that is, if you take it out of the Reformation context, Reformation Sunday, and put it back in a, like a real situation in people's suffering lives, that promise does make sense to me. And then I like how you say, don't just leave it in the past, but now, in the present, what does it mean for the future that God is, uh, I mean, it does talk then very clearly about God's incredible tenacity in yeah. staying with this people God has chosen. 
I was that when you were talking, uh, Joy and Rolf, I, the word that kept coming to my mind was um, persistence. You know, we, the God is just relentlessly <laughs> persistent uh, to uh, to figure out how to stay in relationship with <laughs> us. Uh, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and you know, and that's what I hear in New Covenant. We're going to try this 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 time, and so. Uh, I, and I think that can be a really promising and, and hopeful word right now, uh, and particularly when we're, you know, wondering, uh, I, I think that, that I think people are wondering, like, how, how is this working? How is this relationship with God working right now when I can't maintain the covenant, if you will, like I usually have? of church attendance and, and uh, the ways in which people embody their faith on a regular basis that they've counted on their entire lives, whether that's whatever that ends up being. And I do wonder if there's like this, do, do I, what am, is what I'm doing? Does it still count? Is it still, you know, how am, am I maintaining that relationship with God when I can't do it the way I've always done it? And so maybe that's the word people need to hear is that, yeah, but God's persistent and I, uh, you know, and, and, and that's good news. So I, maybe that's a way to take this text this year uh, in recognizing our own concerns about covenantal keeping. Um, God will figure it out. <laughs> this conversation is seriously like the most, useful thing I've ever learned about this passage. <laughs> I mean, really to imagine it in that context when the city's surrounded and you know your family's about to get, if you're lucky, divided up. Uh, if you're unlucky, wiped out. You know, your, your, your documents are gonna get burned or lost. I mean, all the, every institution you relied upon for survival, for continuance of your identity and family and faith is suddenly at risk of literal destruction and this is the prophecy uh, is incredibly powerful when you think about those kinds of conversations happening, wondering is this the day the walls are gonna fall, right? Or is it next week or a month? I mean that, and I don't wanna compare that to our current COVID circumstances at all, but we are faced with all sorts of questions about institutional, um, well, in some cases, destruction, in some cases, just having been and stripped of the things that make them most useful or the things that draw us to them. Mm -hmm. yeah, really I, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I do, I mean, I agree. It's not like our situation, but there's something, you know, if you've got a loved, if you've had a loved one in a nursing home, which I did um, last year, both my mom and my uncle separately were in two different places. And then eventually, you know, you're wondering is, COVID going to get in there. And in my uncle's case, it did and it killed him. And so there is that sense though, so that of well, my uncle died and clinging to the new covenant uh, in Jesus, you know? And so it's not like, it's not like being besieged by the army, but there is this sense, you know, of we've quarantined ourselves in our houses and trying to keep you know, that disease out, there is something kind of similar, right, about that sense of siege. And when we remember that, oh, sorry. Now, when we remember that this text is talking, is the narrative of a particular people, um, Matt, as you were speaking, I was just hearing allusions to some of the other people groups in our world for whom your descriptions were very real not COVID related. Um, and so I, I think there is a sense in which we do need to hear this story in light of God's faithfulness, uh, tenacity, persistence to uh, edit us back into the narrative we keep right uh, walking ourselves out of and the reality of this moment of how walking out of the narrative looks like, whether it is the armies that are surrounded around us, external, or whether it is our own choices, internal. Yeah, and I and I think when with this conversation and the direction that it's taken, 
uh, really then uh, for me, then when I read the Psalm and you were talking about this earlier, Rolf, like how does this Psalm, you know, it's, it's the Ash Wednesday Psalm and how do we hear it now? Uh, fifth Sunday of Lent. But then, then that really make this conversation really makes me land on verse 11 of this naming of the human condition, this naming of our, this deep fear, uh, or this, this deep sort of sense of, 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 um, yeah, I guess I'll name it as fear. Do not cast me away from your presence. God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. That, 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 that in in both of these texts we have a name we have a naming of that that human fear. Will God please don't abandon me, God? Please don't uh, please keep being persistent. <laughs> please keep being tenacious uh, in my fa- in in my failings, of course. But uh, but it's it's name just naming that fear. I think could be really powerful for people to hear. Um, are we, are we, are we, af- are we afraid of that, that God's <laughs> presence, um, could be taken away or that God would leave us or. Yeah. It, um, I, I just want to point people to Matt, my old friend, Matt Stiff's commentary on the website. Uh, uh I found this, I'm just going to read from it because I found it so beautiful. He, he says the text maintains that sin isn't merely a matter of crime and punishment, it is instead radical and universal, pervading every human life from its beginning. It deafens the sinner to gladness and causes physical agony. It impedes the enjoyment of the good news of God's salvation. Uh, take a look at Matt uh, Stiff's commentary on there. Uh, this is a well-known text, but I think uh, I think he uh, has written lovely and um just given some new angles with his language uh, into the text. How about though, Hebrews five. If nobody likes what we've done so far, there's always Melchizedek. (laughs) I love Melchizedek. Yes. Obviously now you have to explain why you love Melchizedek. I mean, beyond the fact that this is just a really obscure you know, exposition of a really obscure character. Well, uh, that would never have been famous if it weren't for the author of Hebrews <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, Psalm uh, 110. It's his five minutes of fame right here. Yeah, it is. I, it, the text is obviously here because of the first line connects to John. Christ did not glorify himself. And then it takes this turn that Hebrews, you know, in Hebrews, Similar to John, I think that Jesus beca- Jesus is everything. So Jesus is the prophet. He's he's the Messiah. He's you know here, and then here's the high priest. Uh, you know, just another set of of images uh, to try to understand um, the good news. Well, I think it's also connected with like you are my son today. I've begotten you, but there is, but that's not John. <laughs> so yeah, well, there is no I'm... voice from heaven at Jesus' <laughs> baptism saying you are my son because it wouldn't make sense for John. Uh, and so that's an odd connection. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so, but uh, I'm not going to actually talk about why I love Melchizedek because that's a story from from uh, Genesis, but. Uh, the, the sense, uh, all right, I'm going to tie this back. I'm going to try to tie this back to Jeremiah 31. Ready? Okay. So post-exile, um, the, the Jewish people, and you, for, so you can call them second temple Jews. Um, first time that you could really use that word, I think, um, for the people of the Old Testament. Before that, they're Israelites. They became a, a, a hierocracy ruled by priests. Now, back in the old um, 19th century, really anti-Jewish way of reading, uh, coming out of a Hegelian evolutionary understanding of history, misunderstanding of history, that they, um, the, the German Lutherans of my tradition, the prophets were the high point for them. Right? So they've got this talk of justice and this uh, and the righteousness. And then they see in that misunderstanding, when the people became ruled by priests and a people of the law, that became then a devolution for, in that anti-Jewish way of understanding history. 
Actually, that did happen, but it was necessary for the survival and advancement of the people, actually, that post-exile ex- post um, no longer have kings, and uh, the priests took over the role of both um, king and prophet in ruling the people. And so I think by connecting then Jesus' role as the high priest, uh, you're coming to see then that that also that notion of becoming a people of the word led by expositors of the word, Jesus himself uh, takes on that role for us. That is my attempt to make this into something useful. I think that was a a, a, val- a, a valorous, is that a word? A valorous effort, <laughs> effort and you, do, you did well. I love the connection. Um, you went deep there for, for, for a few, few phrases there, uh, but I, I love that. And I, I particularly um, call out the, you know, we, we recognize in uh, the gospels, uh, uh, Jesus like Moses, the prophet, um, Jesus, um, uh, the healer, and, and Hebrews takes us back to the rituals and liturgy and lifts up Leviticus and those acts of the Levites. And so I really appreciate that, uh, Ralph, that here we get Jesus as the high priest, a necessary role that ties back to the history of the people. I I like that. 